It felt like my life was over. This is perceived as potentially very, very dangerous. And to do everything necessary to never get here again. Even if you don't consciously know what the issue is, your subconscious always knows. Let's look at how to actually heal now. Because the reason why you did not stand up for yourself in the first place doesn't exist anymore. I used to hate myself. I suggest you get something to take notes because this will be the most comprehensive video about childhood trauma that you have ever seen. We'll dive in depth to where they come from, where they stem from, how they ingrain in your brain and how to actually resolve them. So let's start with this tree and apologize my handwriting in advance, but you'll have to watch through that. So up here, we start with the symptoms. Um, um, the symptoms are up here on this beautiful tree. Down here at the roots, we have the way more important things, the causes. The causes are down here at the roots. And what most people do when they think about their situation, what they are in, what they are struggling with, they just look at the symptoms and they put band-aid on top of band-aid on top of band-aid on the symptoms that they experience. But the symptoms are caused by childhood trauma in most of the cases, which we'll look at down here. But let's start simple. What are some symptoms that you may experience? That's, for example, people-pleasing. <laughs> I'll just write like this, so you need to remember that. People-pleasing. It's a very common symptom experienced because of childhood trauma. What are other symptoms? Toxic relationships, for example. A toxic relationship is also a symptom. And I apologize, my ground is very noisy. You'll have to get through that. What are other things? For example, a dysregulated nervous system. I just write a DN. Now, a dysregulated nervous symptom is something that many people talk about. Oh, how can I regulate my nervous system better? You have a trauma response, so you need to learn how to regulate a nervous system. And I'm not saying that it's bad or it's wrong, and it's definitely something that can help a lot. But why do you even need to regulate your nervous system in the first place? What is the cause of that? And this is what we need to look at to actually sustainably resolve that. So, what are other symptoms that you may experience in your everyday life? Weak boundaries, for example. You have weak boundaries. You cannot properly stand up for yourself. You always get walked all over by other people and you cannot speak up. This is another symptom. All of these are symptoms. And what you do now, or what most people do now, is they focus on these symptoms, on people-pleasing, toxic relationship, weak boundaries, many other symptoms, dysregulated nervous system, and they impose a change of behavior on top of that. So they try to change their behavior to tackle the symptom, which may work in the short term, but you cannot resolve the symptom with that. It's like you're now putting a band-aid on your deep inner, inner wound, and it will not help you sustainably. What we need to do it, we need to look at and resolve the causes. Now, what are these causes? Childhood trauma. A very important thing we need to understand here is that as small children, many things can be very overwhelming for us because we don't have a quite grasp on what the world is or how the world works. So let's look at a few causes, which are, for example, Toxic parents. And my handwriting is absolutely horrible on this whiteboard. Um, it's not much better on, on a piece of paper, but on this whiteboard is... Um, anyway, toxic parents. One symptom... <laughs> this is so ridiculous. Uh, anyway, can be one cause that causes all of this. Now, it's not toxic parents per se, but what you experience. So that may be an emotionally dysregulated environment, emotionally unhealthy environment. 
Now, things that you may experience are love withdrawal. Love withdrawal. Love withdrawal is maybe something that you experience in your childhood. And this can have a very deeply lasting impact on you. Another thing that you may experience is conditional love. <laughs> and I'll, I'll keep writing like this mostly. It's conditional love. If you only get conditional love, you have to do everything right for the parents, be perfect for them, and only then they show you their love. Now, this can be, for example, you needing to bring home good grades, and only then you experience your parents' love. Now, I'm not saying if one time you bring bad, uh, home a bad grade and your parents are angry at you, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a constant, conditional love experience in your childhood. Other things that make experience is that a sibling gets preferred. A sibling gets preferred. It's another cause what may lead to all of these symptoms. How does that work now? Let's look at it a little bit more in depth. When you are zero to five years old, Yes. When you are zero to five years old, your brain is not fully developed yet and you just came into this world and the first thing that your brain does, it tries to understand what is the world. How does the world work? How can I stay safe in the world? What are the rules of this world? The number one most important thing for your brain is to keep you alive, to make sure you are safe. So it tries to understand what is the world, how can you be safe in this world. When you now have a parent, this is a parent, let's make a mean parent, and this is you, right, this is you. <laughs> oh my god, uh, it's not that important, I, yeah. I sh shouldn't care about this anyway. So this is you. And your parent does, let me take red here, does all of these things down here. Your parent withdraws love from you. Your parent only gives you conditional love. Your parent prefers a sibling. This sends certain signals to your brain. When you are zero to five years old, and try to understand what the world is, your brain tries to understand how can I be safe, and your brain knows, hey, I need someone to take care of me. <laughs> I am zero. I am two. I need someone to be there for me, to nurture me, to take care of me, so I can survive, so I can stay alive. If your parent now gives you the feeling of withdrawing love from you, of only giving you conditional love, this is perceived as potentially very, very dangerous from your brain. Your brain goes, oh God, if my parent withdraws love from me, only gives me conditional love, my parent might abandon me. And if my parent abandons me, I cannot survive on my own. So I need to do everything so my parent doesn't abandon me. So you naturally start to be perfect for your parent. You naturally start to chase for love and approval. You naturally start to do everything right and try to please your parent so your parent doesn't abandon you, so you are safe. This is your trauma response. And this trauma response now leads to all of these symptoms up here, to people-pleasing behavior. The connection is very obvious now, right? Because you try to please your parent and this roots very deeply in your brain with the safety lesson. I need to please my parent to stay safe, to stay alive. I need to place, please other people or it might be dangerous. So you start to develop people-pleasing behavior in general. And this just builds upon each other the more you go through your life. And this also results in all of these other symptoms. Obviously, a dysregulated nervous symptom because your brain is under constant stress. This is survival. 
obviously you will not actually die, right? Your parent will not abandon you, even if they are toxic. You will not actually die. But your brain does not know that. Your brain just sees, there's a human being, this human being needs to take care of me. Oh God, this human being only gives me love with conditional love. I experience love withdrawal, so I need to chase. I need to do everything right to stay alive. This is a lot of stress. So you have a dysregulated nervous system. You have weak boundaries because you cannot have any boundaries here. You don't learn healthy boundaries here from a toxic parent. You learn, you need to please, you need to do everything right. You need to do, you need to basically appeal to their needs so that you don't get abandoned because if you don't do that, it's potentially dangerous, right? We got this so far. This is very, very, very important to understand. Now I've made a few notes so I don't miss anything. So let me look into my notes briefly before we move on here. All right. Yes, I did that. Okay. Now that we understand this, let's move on. I will leave the tree for just a moment here so you know what we are talking about. Oh, actually, actually, we don't need the tree anymore. You got that. So let's move on to the next thing. So to sum this up real quick, stop focusing on the symptoms. If you try to change your behavior to attack a symptom, it will not be sustainable because the causes still remain. You need to get to the cause and heal it at their root. Now, why do these causes ingrain inside of you? Because in childhood, your brain tries to understand what is the world, how to stay safe in the world. And when your parent withdraws love from you, this is potentially dangerous. So you start to chase for love and approval. This can be applied to many different situations in childhood. Let me give you another quick example. If you are in class, in school, and you say something, and then the whole class starts laughing at you. This is emotionally overwhelming for you. We are tribal animals. We need to be um, in our tribe to be safe. And when everybody starts laughing at you, your brain goes, oh God, the tribe maybe pushes me away. So I need to um, chase for love and approval to stay safe, but also I better never do this again. So I'm not in this emotionally overwhelming situation again. Next thing you know is you are an adult, you are at a conference, you stand up and should present something, should speak up something and you get anxiety because it's connected to this past symptom. Now, not all causes are in your childhood, but most of the time you can retrace back the causes to your earliest childhood. Now, let's look at, at your, and um, maybe you can already see, Guess what I'm drawing here? Not what you think. Get out of here with your mind. Now, maybe it gets a little bit clearer. This is <laughs> your brain. This is a perfect image of your brain. Now, we have simplified three parts in your brain. We have your reptilian brain or your instinctual brain. Then we have your mammalian brain or your emotional brain and then we have your neocortex or your logical thinking brain yeah your neocortex is the newest part of your brain in our evolution history the neocortex is basically our human brain it's the newest part of our brain that developed last your neocortex is what you use right now to watch this video it's a part of your brain that goes oh yeah that makes sense or the part of your brain that goes, this guy is full of bullshit. That doesn't make any sense, sense at all. That's your neocortex. Your emotional part of your brain or your malleable brain, obviously, as the name suggests, is where your emotions are located, roughly simplified. And your instinctual part of your brain or your reptilian part of your brain, your brain stem, this is the oldest part of your brain and is there where your instincts are located. Now, when we talk about trauma and about childhood, what we just talked about before, trauma roots in these parts of your brain, 
in your emotional and instinctual part of your brain, in your reptilian and mammalian brain. Your neocortex does not have a lot to do with your trauma. This is why when you try to logically understand and think about your trauma, it will not help you resolve it. Like this is why when you think about, hmm, I fall for toxic people, so maybe I should have boundaries in place. Let me think about what could be boundaries I should put into place. Sure, this is a good coping mechanism. It can help you in the short term, but long term it's not sustainable. Because if you do that and you encounter a toxic person, you will always have this laundry list of things in your mind where you say, hmm, this person was that toxic? Or am I overreacting? What is my boundary now? Should I put it into place? What should be the consequence? What should I do here? This is not what we want. We don't want to logically think about what boundary should I put into place here? This doesn't really help you. It's not sustainable. So when you logically think about your trauma, this is also something that you often do in therapy. When you are in therapy, the thought ofness that if you logically think about your trauma, if you understand what happens, if you understand how of all of that in your childhood connects to your symptoms that you experience, then there will be one form of resolution and you will be able to let go of your trauma. Unfortunately, almost never works. Now, I'm not a therapist. I don't intend to be a therapist. I'm a coach and I'm a hypnotist. I work with the subconscious, I heal trauma at its root, I help resolve trauma at its root, I guide my clients through them resolving their trauma at its root. And this is how it's probably formulated best. Um, but I've seen this time and time again with many of my clients who have been in therapy for decades, literally, for way over 10 years. So I assume one decade, not decades, one decade, over one decade, <laughs> it's long enough in my opinion, uh, and they only developed a set of coping skills. But the issues were still there. And this cannot be your goal. At least I don't think it should be your goal. Now, I'm not saying therapy doesn't have a place. I'm not saying therapy cannot help you. I'm not saying therapy cannot help you resolve things. If it works for you, more power to you. Amazing, fantastic. But if it doesn't, if you still experience symptoms, then you maybe want to pay very close attention to this because this is the exact issue. As I said, logically thinking about your trauma will not help you resolve it because this is where your trauma ingrains and roots, in your emotional and instinctual part of your brain. This is, simplified speaking, your subconscious. And when we want to heal trauma, we need to go here to resolve it. No, not necessarily here, but into this, all of this. One thing that many people struggle with is that this part does not communicate in logic, right? This is logic. No, <laughs> no, 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 we are not, we don't want logic. The logical part of your brain is your neocortex, this here. And as we just established, your neocortex has nothing to do with your trauma, with resolving this at its root. This part of your brain communicates in emotions and pictures. So the techniques, the subconscious healing techniques that can be used resolving this are not logical. They don't work logical. A very common technique that is kind of on the rise more and more and luckily finally also more and more gets recommended by therapists is EMDR. EMDR basically mimics your eye movement during sleep. During your deep sleep phase you have emotional processing and you go through your trauma while doing that and like this you can process it. A very good technique. What I personally use is hypnosis. Hypnosis, and we'll talk about how that works later on, but hypnosis helps you to access the trauma at its very root, look at it, and resolve it on a subconscious level. Now again, your subconscious communicates in emotions and pictures, so the techniques used 
your, your logical part of your brain will often scream, this is bullshit, this cannot work, this doesn't make any sense. And that's right, it doesn't for the logical part of your brain. What we don't focus on the logical part of your brain, we focus on this part of your brain, on your emotional brain, on your instinctual brain, on your subconscious. Now, I have to warn you, when you start healing and working on yourself, many people don't do enough. They start working on themselves and then they feel okay. And because they feel okay, they stop working on themselves and they fall back. And I need to show you how that looks like so you understand what to do. So let's move on to the next thing here. And this is also the part where I talk a little bit about myself. Um, a little bit about my background. I used to hate myself absolutely hate myself for still for still the most part of my life right because of childhood wounds um, i don't need to go in depth into that my my biological father left and this ingrained a deep sense of not being good enough inside of me and this root, rooted or resulted in self-hatred now this self-hatred I thought about where does this come from and took small steps to, to work on that basically since I was 13 years old. The self-hatred basically started about when I was 12. It started to slowly creep in, but only very small steps. Nothing really that helped me. So this inevitably led me into a very unhealthy relationship. And when this relationship ended, I hit rock bottom where I basically was in so much emotional pain, I didn't know what to do next, how to move forward. It felt, it felt like my life is over, right? Because it was so much emotional pain. But this pain forced me to take action and work on myself. Now I can talk about all of this, like relatively neutral, because I'm very disconnected from this part of my life. It doesn't even feel like this happened to me anymore because I have resolved all of this and healed from this. Now, what we need to understand here is, um, when we look at this graph here, and this is basically positive emotions up here, positive emotions and negative emotions down here. And let's say down here we have rock bottom. This is rock bottom. And now you go through your life or people go through their lives and they are maybe up here, everything is fine. And then emotional pain starts to get stronger and it's always an up and down, but it starts to get stronger. And at one point you hit rock bottom. At one point you hit rock bottom and the pain just becomes emotionally overwhelming and too much for you to handle and you have to take action. Rock bottom, how I define rock bottom is the point where the pain is so strong that there's no alternative, but you have to take action and do something or the pain becomes less. That's how I define rock bottom. And the funny thing, or the, the unfortunately very, very sad thing, let's say it like this, about human beings is that only if they experience enough pain, they will finally move and do something. If you are maybe here and watch this video right now, right, and you are not here yet, I hope I so hope that you will take action and will work on yourself and will move heaven and earth to net, not get down here. But my experience tells me that you likely will not do that. You will see all of this and you will think, oh yeah, good to know that. Um, I need to work on this at one point, but uh, I'm, I'm here, like it's not bad enough yet. And you will likely only take really action, the necessary action when you hit rock bottom. This is unfortunately how it happens most of the time. How it happened for me, how it happened for all of my clients, how it happened for all of the people I've talked with in the past couple of years. So I hope, my sincere hope is that you take this video as the first step of healing and now take the necessary action to heal from this and not hit rock bottom. But as I said, again, it's likely that this is not the case and that you will need to grow up bottom at one point. Now, when you are at rock bottom, and this is important because rock bottom can be the best moment of my life. 
In hindsight, when I am asked, hey, what's the best moment of your life? I would say this. Rock bottom was the best moment of my life. Why? Because it forced me to take action. I wouldn't be here talking about this today if I would have never hit rock bottom. It forced me to work on myself. It gave me so much emotional pain that there was no other way but to work on myself and to do everything necessary to never get here again. So that's what I did. I started working on myself. And what most people do, and don't be that person, is that they start working on themselves and they get up here and they get up here and they stop working on themselves. They stop because they feel like, hey, hey everybody, I'm not rock bottom anymore. I am fine. I am here so I can stop working on myself. And guess what happens? Maybe they also experience this occasionally. But guess what happens if they stop working on themselves? Let me draw this line a little bit further, huh? because you know what happens. They will hit rock bottom again. Because they didn't heal the subconscious wounds that caused them to get here in the first place. Think back to the tree that we just talked about. Think back to the tree. They didn't resolve the roots, the causes. So they get back here. They just did symptom management. They put band-aids on their symptoms. So they will hit rock bottom again eventually. And what happens is that many people are stuck in a cycle like this. They hit rock bottom, they put band-aids on their symptoms, they feel better, they stop working on themselves, they hit rock bottom again, they put band-aids on their symptoms, they feel better, they stop working on themselves, they hit rock bottom again, and it continues repeating. Let's draw another line here. And this is the line. It's probably a bit higher, but you get what I mean. It doesn't really matter that much. This is a line that you want to get at. So don't be that person. We forget about that person. This is not you. You are this person here. right? You are this person here. Or if you are really good. And again, my sincere hope for you is that you are this person, but likely you are this person here. I hope you are this person here. Not likely you are this person down here. I hope that you are this person here. Actually, let's keep blue. No, actually, let's do let's do red. I hope that you are this person here, but likely you are this person here. You start working on them, on yourself, right? You start working on yourself, then up and down. Maybe it's very deep down, it's very high up, like it's always an up and down working on yourself. It's never a straight line, but there's an upwards trajectory. So it's an up and down, and at one point you cross this. This here is a nuclear point where you want to get at. Crossing this line means you can never hit rock bottom again. Now, never say never, but with 99.9% .9 of certainty, you are so grounded up here. You are so grounded in your own sense of self-worth, in your own sense of self-love, in your self-trust, that you know, hey, life is always an up and down, right? There will always be an up and down, and that's okay. You accept it, you embrace it, you move forward. You will never ever come down here again. 99.9% .9 of certainty not come down here again. Because you know, whatever negative comes, it will be gone eventually. Nothing can drag you down that much anymore. Because rock bottom is completely in your mind. Uh, all of this is completely in your mind. It's, it's mental, emotional pain. but if you're mentally so resilient that you know, let's draw that. If you're mentally so resilient that you know, hey, whatever comes my way, I can deal with that. And if I cannot deal with it in a way that it goes away, I still can deal with that 
in a way that it doesn't emotionally destroy me. Right? And you can get to this point. I am pretty sure I am at this point. Obviously, it's always hard to evaluate yourself, but I would say I couldn't imagine anything in my life that would cause me to hit rock bottom again. And I experienced quite a, a few things after I hit rock bottom again, and I did not fall down there again. Um, also, health issues um, where you don't have any control over, but it still doesn't cause you to hit rock bottom, um, because if you're mentally resilient, you just take things as they come and accept life. So when you are up here, when you've crossed this nuclear point, whenever, you just need to cross it once, we say when you cross this point once, you have reached this place, then nothing can drag you down anymore. Of course, of course, life always looks like this, then up and down, and you will be a negative up and down, and maybe you will be very deep negative, right? This is a loved one dying. Obviously, you will not be positive then. Very, very deep negative. But you will not hit rock bottom because you will deal with your feelings. You will allow your pain. You will do what is necessary. You will embrace what comes your way. Accept it eventually. And you know life goes on and it can go on happy. And it will go on happy for you. Not in that moment, maybe not for a while, but eventually. So this is where you want to get. So when you hit rock bottom, let's sum that up real quick. When you hit rock bottom, this can be the biggest opportunity of your life. But you need to use it to take the necessary action to work on yourself in a way that you reach this point. And for that, subconscious ceiling work is usually necessary. And we'll look in a second on how, how that looks like. But you don't want to stop working on yourself when you feel fine, hey, I'm okay, because chances are you are still very low here somewhere, maybe a bit here, but you will hit rock bottom again eventually because you have too many wounds inside of you that are unresolved. So when you hit rock bottom, use that as fuel to work on yourself until you are up here. Now, let me look at my notes again, so make sure I don't forget anything. Um, and I hope this all is valuable so far. If this is valuable so far, if that all makes sense, uh, leave a like, that would be amazing. Leave a like uh, and I'll look at my notes real quick. Alright. Good. Mm -mm. Yes. Alright, good. Then we move on to how to actually heal. All right, we understand childhood causes, we understand the symptoms, we understand hitting rock bottom can the biggest, be the biggest opportunity of your life. Excuse me. But let's look at how to actually heal now. Let's draw another graph for that. <laughs> okay, so, all right, here we have emotional intensity, all right, down here is just time, it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's have another red line. This red line is emotionally overwhelming. Let's write, let me see if I can write this kind of so that you can read it. Overwhelming. <laughs> overwhelming. Uh, anyway, this is when things for you get emotionally overwhelming. You remember in childhood ages 0 to 5, this is important now, between the ages 0 to 5 your brain tries to understand what is the world, how to stay safe in this world. So many things can be very easily emotionally overwhelming for you. You go through your life, yeah, things are good, it's an up and down, and then bam, something happens that is emotionally overwhelming for you. This is, for example, your mother 
of father withdrawing love from you. Now, before we go further, it's important to mention here that this is always individually different, right? For some people, they can experience a lot of fucked up shit in their childhood and it doesn't really face them or doesn't really traumatize them or emotionally ingrain. For some it ingrains more, for some, some it ingrains less. Some um, have, a, have a lower um, red line, so to speak. Some have a higher red line. Um, for some people need to experience events repetitively more often. For some people it's enough when they experience one event and this roots very deeply. It's all individually different. We just want to understand the mechanism behind of how it works. Okay? You can have individual differences. So, situation is emotionally overwhelming. What happens now? Your brain goes, Oh God, this is so much emotional pain. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know what to do with this. It's too much. It's too much to handle. So it seals all of this emotional pain inside of a box. Right? All of this emotional, overwhelming feelings are sealed inside of your box and stored in your subconscious. It's still there. It doesn't go away. That's why you always need to allow your emotions. We'll get to that maybe a little bit later. But you always need to allow your emotions, otherwise they just stay inside of you. And there they build up and can never resolve. So if you have an overwhelming emotional situation, the emotions get stored inside of your subconscious. Together, and remember what I told you, ages 0 to 5, what is the world? How to stay safe in the world? How to stay alive in the world? Together with a safety lesson. And we already breached upon that. <laughs> My hands. Um, anyway, we already breached upon that. When your parent withdraws love from you, right, your parent withdraws love from you, your brain goes, oh god, this is emotionally overwhelming, so it's potentially dangerous, I might get abandoned, this is potentially life-threatening, because if I get abandoned, I die. This roots very deeply, because your brain, number one purpose, keep you alive. It says, okay, let's store that in the subconscious together with the safety lesson that we always need to chase for love and approval to stay safe. We better make sure to chase for love and approval to stay safe, to stay alive. This is your trauma response. This is what plays up again and again throughout your entire life. Probably this doesn't happen once, but multiple times when you have toxic parents, so it just builds on top of each other. What we call this is an ISE, or um, Initial Sensitizing Event. There can be multiple ISEs, but usually like there's one root cause where everything started. This is the root cause. This is the cause of your symptoms. Right? Your mother withdrawing love from you is one example. It can be a thousand different examples. You being laughed at in class. Your biological father leaving. Right? It can be a thousand different things. I had a client once and she was alone in a room, one year old, two years old, and she started screaming and screaming and crying, and her mother didn't came, didn't come. Her mother came too late, after a while. But the time my client was in that room, two years old, screaming, crying, her, bra her brain went, wait, no one is coming? Oh God, no one is coming, we are all alone. This might be potentially dangerous, life-threatening. Her mother came eventually, but not fast enough, so her brain emotionally deeply ingrained this as a potentially dangerous situation and she started to chase her love and approval to be better to not experience a situation like this again because your, her brain um, equals this to um, her mother abandoning her because she was not good enough right because it was uh, too much of a time discrepancy between when when she started crying and between when her mother came again individual differences 
I'm not saying if as a child you were in a room alone and started crying, you have a deep emotional trauma. I'm not saying that. I am saying individual differences. I'm saying this could be a potential cause inside of you, maybe together with other things. But yeah, this is how it looks like. When you now go throughout your life, this builds up on top of each other and you experience similar situations. And again, they just keep building on top of each other. Like this. When you don't resolve that, it just gets stronger. So let's stick with the chasing for love and approval. You chase for love and approval um, because your brain uh, wants to stay safe, wants to stay alive. Then you also chase for love and approval when it comes to your friends. Because when a friend says, uh, but I don't like you because you did this and that, then your brain goes, oh God, where did we experience that again? Oh yes, here. We experienced this again here and there. It was potentially dangerous. So we better try everything so our friend likes us and it builds on top of each other. You experience the same thing with your colleagues in work, in your romantic relationships. And this is usually the number one reason why people find themselves in toxic relationships or with, with narcissists, by the way, because of this deep need to chase for love and approval and narcissists prey on that. Right? This is how narcissists have a very easy, um, easy approach to build up a trauma bond and emotional dependency for you. So you need to heal that if you want to prevent this from happening. So it just builds on top of each other and gets stronger and stronger and stronger every time. It yeah, gets stronger and stronger every time, as I already said. What I want to do now is I want to explain you how to you how to heal that. And I'll show you an actual real life example of a client uh, where we go into exactly this and I show you how that functionally works in, in just a moment. But first of all, let me explain it verbally. Then I show you an example and then we can talk about it a little bit more. I hope everything we talked about makes sense so far, right? Because this is now the conclusion of it all, how to actually work on this and how to heal it. Good. What do we do? Either um, let's talk about EMDR first. I personally, I don't use EMDR, I use hypnosis. But my main goal, my, my main mission, what I try to accomplish here is that you work on yourself, that you get this handled, that you resolve this. My main goal is not that you do this with me. Of course, you can do that with me. But however you decide to do this, please do it. Right? Be the person um, that works on there, if you remember the, the rock bottom graph, be the person that works on themselves until they hit the line of, of no return to rock bottom. Be that person. So let's talk about EMDR first. What happens during EMDR is that you recall consciously, most of the time, whatever the traumatic ingraining situation is. You recall that consciously, the ISE, then you talk about that and then you mimic the eye movements during sleep, during your, your deep sleep phase, which is where emotional processing happens. And like this, you emotionally process the ISE. And this is exactly what needs to be done. It needs to be emotionally processed. The emotions need to be processed so they can resolve. Otherwise, this will stay inside of you for the rest of your life. Now, if you have a very good practitioner with EMDR, um, your subconscious will also be activated. And your subconscious may lead you into things that you're not consciously aware of. For example, my client, we got there during hypnosis when she was there um, one, two years old, uh, alone in a room, started crying. This is nothing you are consciously aware of. If you have a good practitioner who uses EMDR, um, he will help you to tap into your subconscious and he will get you there, or, or she. So this is what happens during EMDR, um, I suppose, from what I have seen about EMDR. Again, I don't practice EMDR. 
Now, what I use is hypnosis. So let me tell and talk you through how this works. During hypnosis, what we do is we basically, first of all, we have an induction, then we have general negativity clearing, these kind of things. Then we resource you to make sure in case something overwhelming comes up, you can deal with that, we can handle that. And then what we basically do on a functional level, we ask your subconscious. During hypnosis, your subconscious is very, very activated. In fact, we only, I only talk to your subconscious. It may feel like you're consciously aware. It always feels like you're consciously aware of what happens, um, but your subconscious is activated the whole time. So I basically ask your subconscious, hey, subconscious, bring me back here. Bring me back to this where it happened and your subconscious does it. Because even if you don't consciously know what the issue is, your subconscious always knows. Your subconscious always knows or it wouldn't be an issue. And that's the beauty of it. So your subconscious will always bring us back to where we need to be. This is also, by the way, um, just as a quick side note, um, I'll make this here. It, it doesn't belong to the graph, just so you understand it. If you have a symptom, um, to my ugly handwriting again, and you have a cause. All you need to know is the symptom. You just need to know the symptom, right? If, if you have the symptom, in fact, all you need to know is the feeling. If you have a negative feeling, um, we just ask your subconscious, hey, bring us back to the cause of that negative feeling. Where did it happen for the first time? And your subconscious brings us back there. Because again, your subconscious always knows. If your subconscious wouldn't know, it wouldn't be an issue. So your subconscious brings us back here. What we then do, actually like, let me take red for that. What we then do on a functional level, and this is, you know, see the similarity between um, EMDR because functionally it all works the same. Again, EMDR, you recall this and then you recall this, go through it with the eye movement. What we do during hypnosis, we are back there in the situation and what we do is we watch it and we watch it again and we watch it again. We watch the situation that happened over and over and over again. And what happens while we watch it over and over and over again is we give your subconscious the space that it needs to process all of the emotions that are attached to that memory by feeling them. There is no way around feeling your feelings. You need to feel your feelings so they can run their natural course throughout your body and resolve. By the way, if this all sounds a little bit abstract or woo-woo for you, I totally get you. Maybe a bit more to my background. I actually, back in the days, I studied, I have a bachelor's degree in chemical and environmental engineering. So I have a very logical thinking, analytical mind and brain. When I first learned about this, I was like, what bullshit is that? That cannot work. But um, I always try to have an open mind and I don't dismiss any things before looking into them. And I cannot deny the amazing, I couldn't deny the amazing results all of this got. So I got into it. And well, now here I am and I'm using this since a few years now to help people to heal from exactly that. So that, that um, just to that. But yeah, we watch it over and over again. And with every time you, you watch it, you give your subconscious the space to process the emotions by feeling them and they will become less and less and less until they are gone until they are at a zero. What do we then, what do we do then? You maybe see, oh, we still have the safety lesson here. This is not always necessary, but it's always good practice to do it. We basically go back a few moments before this ISE had a chance to ever happen. Then we step into the picture as your adult self. Again, this is just for your subconscious. No logic needed here. This is just for your subconscious. And then as your adult self, you tell your younger self, your baby self, everything that he or she needs to deal with the coming situation in a better way. Everything that he or need, she needs to understand that you are safe and that nothing here can hurt you any longer. Right? And you can also 
anything that you maybe think would be worth it can put it in there as well that you maybe want to have. Like this we re-educate and give you another safety lesson and clear the ISE. What then often happens functionally is that all of these others, um, actually let me just do this, all of these others also clear in a ripple effect. It doesn't have to happen though. It doesn't have to happen. It happens sometimes, but it doesn't have to happen. So what we then do is we go into all of these one by one and repeat this procedure. And like this, you heal the actual cause. You heal the actual cause, and when you heal the cause, the symptom will take care of itself. When you are a people pleaser, or when you have trouble setting boundaries, let's take this because there you can see it very, very well. When you have trouble setting boundaries, and you always worry, oh God, um, was I too harsh? Should I set a boundary here? Should I set a boundary there? And I've seen this with, with most of my clients, with all of my clients when we have properly resolved the ISE, right? Um, with all of my clients when we have properly resolved the ISE. Now, sometimes sessions can take long and it gets too much. I don't want to put too much on you, so we maybe need to come back at a later date, right? So we resolve things at a later date. Um, but, but when we have properly resolved the ISE, I've seen it with all of my clients and I see it again and again. So, boundaries. First, um, before you were in a situation where someone overstepped your boundary and you worry, oh, what should I do now? Um, should I stand up for myself? Uh, I don't know. There are a lot of negative feelings. I'd rather not do anything. We go in here. We resolve the ISE of you not being able to stand up for yourself. Uh, and then, first of all, you often don't necessarily feel much different. You will feel exhausted. You will feel very exhausted because your subconscious just processed a lot. So you will probably feel very tired. But you'll probably not feel that much difference. But the magic happens when you are in the situation again. When you are the next time in a situation where someone oversteps your boundaries, you will not worry about, oh, what should I do now? This thought will not even come up. You will just be in the situation and then you will naturally stand up for yourself and naturally disengage, put a boundary in place or tell the person off without even needing to think about it big time. Now, there can be a little bit of an adjustment period where maybe a bit worry comes up before, but you will do it. You will just do it because it's so unfathomable for your subconscious for you to not stand up for yourself any longer. Because the reason why you did not stand up for yourself in the first place doesn't exist anymore. It's resolved. And this is how you actually resolve trauma and triggers at their root and truly change your life. Now, let me show you the example with my client. And you will see a couple of things here. I will put it in the video and, and shortly, but you will see a couple of things. First of all, you, and uh, you can disregard that, but first of all, you will see me very excited <laughs> when I talk. I am basically whipping forward and backward. Um, this was a couple of years ago. So back then I always got very excited when I got to help people and I got to witness the uh, quote unquote magic again, right? Um, it was uh, not, not quite in the beginning. I was already one year in or maybe two years in, but it was still very fresh. And I was always like really excited to, yes, I get to help people again. So you'll, you'll see that. And this is why <laughs> I'm moving like this. So and not like crazy, but like a little bit. So this, this is that. And then you will see, uh, by the way, it's on Zoom. All my work is online. I almost always work online. So you will, you will see uh, my client. And you don't see the whole process. Like the induction is already done. Resourcing is already done. Uh, general negativity clearing is already done. This is already done. We jump in right at the moment where we go into the ISE. We go into the ISE. I... I prompt for that, I ask questions for that, then we arrive at the ISE, and then my client basically just tells me what she sees. She tells me what she sees, what is happening, and then most importantly, what she feels. Because this is where we want to get at. This is what we want to resolve. What she feels, um, 
And this is um, how, how it works functionally. This is what you will see. I will not show you how we go over that again and again. What then happens further is we just watch it again and again and the emotions become less and less and it's resolved. Um, but I'll show you just functionally how we get into the ISE so you see how that actually looks like. All right, here we go. In a moment, not yet, but in just a moment, on that screen in front of you, there's going to appear the very first scene situation, the root cause of why the feelings around your ex are still coming up and when the feelings came up for the very first time. And we are going to find ourselves back in that situation on the count of three. One, getting closer and closer. Two, to the very first scene situation, to the root cause of why these feelings inside of you are still coming up, finding yourself all the way back there, fully aligning with it on the count of three. And I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions and you answer with the first impression that comes to your mind. Is it nighttime or daytime? Daytime. Daytime, fantastic. And are you inside or outside? Outside. Outside, perfect. And are you alone or with people? With people. With people, okay, great. And as you look down on yourself, do you have like little girl hands, big girl hands? Little girl. Little girl hands. And as you look further down, do you wear shoes or are you barefoot? I'm wearing shoes. You wear shoes, okay, fantastic. And look around you, tell me what is happening around you. Um, we're in my first ever backyard. And there's um, like the monkey bars, like set, you know, where you can um, mm -hmm. swing from bar to bar. Yeah. And yeah. my best friend is there. And then my one of my dad's best friends is there. And he's like, I think, and my dad's also there. And he, he's like getting us to compete, see who can do what faster. Um, and I'm worse at everything. You're worse at everything? Mm -hmm. And as you're there competing and you're worse at everything, what happens next? I just, I feel like for one of the first times really feel like comparison to another girl. And like, I did not entertain the guy, you know? And it's not like sexual, it's just like, I was not good enough for him. Okay, this is basically how we got here into the uh, ISE. Now, um, there are a few things uh, that I didn't, didn't necessarily show in the video, uh, but that need to be done to make sure you actually get here, right? When you just prompt for, hey, let's go back to what, wherever, it may be that you reach a point here, that you reach this point, another memory that may happen. There are things you need to do to make sure that this gets cleared. Uh, and this is often the issue when someone works with a practitioner that is not that skilled. May it be EMDR or hypnosis or whatever, that you maybe go to one of these and then you work on that. Quite often these people don't even get there, um, but when you work with someone who is okay, but not that skilled, you get to one of these and then you clear that, uh, but you don't take care of, the, of all the other issues and also not of the, of the initial sensitizing event that comes first which is what absolutely needs to be taken care of. So if you have, a, have ever experienced any hypnosis and you did not feel much better afterwards, or if you hear people talking about, yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't really feel a difference, this is why. Because you didn't get here and you didn't clear it properly. But just know that it definitely makes a huge difference when you work with someone, how skilled the practitioner is. So don't... Um, don't or watch out that you work with someone who is properly skilled. And ideally you find people who have worked with this person before that you can talk with, right? Former clients, former whatever, 
Um, again, I want to want to make very clear here that I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist. Everything I'm saying here is based on my personal experience, on what I've learned from my teachers, um, on what I've worked with with my clients. Right, so I want to make this very clear here. Now in saying that, if you are one of the people who have been stuck in therapy for multiple years, maybe even a decade, you can stay stuck in therapy for the next 30 years and get a bunch of coping mechanisms that maybe help you to deal with the issues better in the moment, to deal with the symptoms better in the moment, but the triggers will always be there, as long as you don't resolve the root cause. Now, I of course highly suggest that you resolve the root cause, obviously, and you can do that with my help if you want. If you want to, reach out to me uh, on Twitter, send me an email on Instagram, you can find the links in the description uh, and you can just message me and we can talk about that. And what I would suggest in any case is that you get my free subconscious healing mini course that gets you started with a free, very easy techniques that you can use to start working with your subconscious, that gives you a few explanations. Um, I already give you a lot of explanations, but a more concise explanation of things. So I suggest you get started with that mini course. Do that in any case. You can find the link in the description, probably also in the pinned comment. And I'll see you in the next video right over here.